Greetings, I'm Zachary Hepner. Pleased to share this Tvar Torah with you for Parshat Vayechi. Let's start with a question. Was there anything inappropriate between the marriage of Joseph and his Egyptian wife, Asnat, the daughter of the high priest Potiphar? Let's start this investigation regarding rabbinic sources to the new technology of surrogacy. There are no legal texts in our rabbinic tradition that address the issue of surrogacy or parental rights, though the issue is addressed in the Agadic rabbinic literature. Matriarch uh, Leah Imenu, having a tradition or premonition that there will be 12 tribes of Israel, she felt it was inappropriate to mother more than six of the tribes. Having bore six sons, she and her sister, Rachel Imenu, had both became pregnant at the same time. Leah prayed for her baby, if it were a boy, and if Rachel's baby was a girl, for a switcheroo. God heard Leah's prayer and executed a switcheroo. Leah bore Dina, and Rachel bore Joseph. There are many reasons why Chazal <coughs> would read such tradition, a tradition into the texts. Close readings of the text indicate epigenetic elements of tomboy characteristics into Dina and tomgirl traits attributed towards Joseph. There are many rabbinic and textual layers, including philosophical reasons why Chazal would insist on this switch. There are also halachic insights and ramifications. It sheds light on the notion of motherhood and surrogacy. <coughs> who is the mother? The woman who produces the egg or the woman who bears the pregnancy? With technology of the future, there could theoretically be multiple surrogates or no woman bearing the baby at all. Ortho orthogonally, or not, not tangentially, who did the children of Israel marry and bear their children? On the births by Akumu Chobanav v'chobnotav l'nachamo, all his sons and daughters sought to comfort him. All his daughters? How many daughters exactly did Jacob have? I thought he only had one daughter. Rashi quotes a Midrash. Midrash Rabbah 84. We don't have the version of Rashi's Midrash Rabbah today, but Rashi quotes Rabbi Nehemiah that it's a term of affection to call your daughters-in-law your daughters. But Rabbi Yehuda says, Rabbi Yehuda Omer, each boy was born with a twin sister girl. These sisters married different brothers. There's no incest problem pre-Sinai for marriages between siblings who share the same father but don't share the same mother. The, situ the solution of Rabbi Yehuda actually creates new problems. Rabbi Yehuda had each brother pair off to each sister of a different mother. This creates more questions. If you do the simple math, that leaves one brother, particularly one son of Leah, unable to marry with no girl to pair off to him. Another problem is that one solution of this problem leads to even more questions. Shimon, son number two of Leah, insists that he would marry Dina, and he did, according to one medrash. This is the medrash on Shaul ben HaKna'anit, where the medrash attributes that Shaul, the son of Kna'anit, is in fact the son of Shimon and Dina. How could Shimon marry Dina, the sister of both his father, not a problem, and Leah, his mother, certainly a familial incest-related problem? Are you following my logic? Shimon was aware of the complicated issues of surrogacy and realized that his mother, Leah, was the surrogate mother of Dina, but Rachel was, the, was Dina's egg donor. Shimon felt confident enough to associate Dina as his sister, but not his kin. This explains the medrash of how Shimon married Dina and circumvented the problem of incest. Now let's veer to Yosef. Was there a problem with his marriage to an Egyptian? Well, they're not Semites. That's a problem. 
nor are they Hittites nor Canaanites. That could be good. Could the marriage be condemnable because Egyptians are Hamites? Abraham and Isaac made quite an effort to groom the prospective daughters-in-law for their chosen child. Let's loop back to the text in our parsha, Parshat Vayechi. Jacob is in his last days, and he's about to bless his grandchildren, Ephraim, Umenashe. Then he interjects a double blessing, not towards his grandchildren, but towards his son, Yosef. This verse is often misquoted and attributed towards the grandchildren. Parenthetically, I'm quoting both verse 15 and 16 in deference to the Nitziv who insists that verse 16 must be read in context of an extension of verse 15, because angels are not prime movers, only God is a prime mover. So here is both verses. And he blessed Joseph, saying, The God in whose ways my father Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who had been my shepherd from my birth to this day, and he tells Joseph, The messenger, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm, bless the lads. And then may my name be recalled in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And may they be teeming multitudes upon the earth. Hamalach hagoeloti mikora. Who is this angel? He invokes God and then he invokes an angel? How preposterous. Again, See the Nitziv who locally addresses this matter. Jacob saw many angels in his journeys, but there is only one pericope when the angel actually talks to Jacob. It is the angel in Padan Aram who tells Jacob that God will give Jacob Lot's portfolio. He showed him the animal husbandry method. Jacob then executes in order to obtain ownership of Lavan's flock. Jacob was referring to that angel, the one who was familiar with genetics and epigenetics. That angel is the one Jacob evoked for protection towards Joseph, because Joseph might be Zerakodesh from a kosher lineage, but his grandchildren will need siyata deshmaya, protection and blessings, because they too are inheritors of Abraham's blessing. As a result, there is no problem with Ephraim Umenasheh. Wishing you all a Shabbat Shalom.